ovarian cysts. And then the subspecialty aspects um, include working with oncofertility in the um, pediatric cancer patients and um, ambiguous genitalia and disorders of sexual differentiation. And then um, the subspecialists at UNM have been fantastic about sending me patients that are cardiac transplant, renal transplant for contraception. Great. Great. Why don't we... I'm Mary Burns, I'm a PA with the school-based child pilot. <coughs> okay. My name is Marie Cruz. Uh, Canales, and I'm a CA for Grant Middle School and Wilson Middle School. So what does CA stand for? A clinical assistant. Okay. And I'm Gail Michael. I'm clinical assistant at Highland High School. I'm Chris Cadrillo. I'm with Envision New Mexico. Uh, my name is Elia. I'm a UNM dietetic intern, and right now I'm doing my research rotation here at Envision. Okay. Jane McGrath, director of Envision. Jane Epstein, nurse practitioner at Albuquerque High. Jenny Shared, Program Coordinator for School-Based Health Centers. And Monica Kozlowski, Nurse Practitioner, PRN, School-Based Health Center. <laughs> Great. All right. And let's go ahead and check in one more time to see if anybody else has joined us. It looks like there we have uh, Cheryl and Julie so far. And this is Elizabeth Vargas. I'm a school nurse. Welcome. Anybody else? Okay, without further ado. Okay. Oh, I guess I'm supposed to let you guys read this. Uh, we just have to have it up. Um, basically, this just says, but well, you already found the audio, so star pound to mute yourself if you need to. All right. This is Kay Griffith. Um, Carol Morgan and Amanda Blatnick in Portales Public Health. Oh, that's great. Great, thanks for joining us. Okay, these are the slides I've seen before. So, um, we're going to talk about um, all forms of contraception, a little bit about teen pregnancy in the United States and in New Mexico specifically. Um, I'm going to focus on the long-acting reversible contraceptions for a couple of reasons that, um, that we'll go over. And then implanon specifically, or next planon, because um, there's a possibility that we'll be putting it in, or you guys will be putting it in as part of the school-based health, which is fantastic. And then the depo, patch, ring, and OCPs, just kind of some pearls on what they can be used to treat um, other symptoms and what common side effects are. If we start running low on time, we'll just go to their emergency contraception since that's pretty uh, important. And this cartoon is just demonstrating one of the big problems with um, uh, uh, contraception with adolescents, and that's just kind of getting something that they'll take and use and, and not forget. So the reason that this is really important is that the U.S. has the highest rate of teen pregnancy in the developed world. About uh, third, the CDC says that up to a third of teenagers in the U.S. will get pregnant. Um, there's increased risk of complication with pregnancy. So um, a lot of times people said that it's there's. Uh, they become a high-risk pregnancy if they're pregnant as a teen because they have all of these horrible outcomes. But when they weeded out, they're like, you know, a lot of that's probably due to socioeconomic factors. When they did look at that, they found that um, insufficient prenatal care, late to prenatal care, low birth weight, and preterm delivery was higher regardless of socioeconomic status in um, girls that got pregnant when they were teenagers. And then the postpartum, they're at increased risk for postpartum depression, to experience intimate partner violence. It's less likely that their child will receive a quality education. It's less likely that they'll graduate from college. Um, and then girls that have a baby before they um, turn 20, 20% 20, um, of them will go on to have another baby before they turn 20. So two kids before 20. Um, and this is why we really care about it in New Mexico. So this is a map of the United States, and this is per 100,000 teens. So if you look, New Mexico is in the, the blue, or the bright blue, and that's 50 to 64 um, births. So this is not pregnancy, this is births. Um, 50 to 64 births per 100,000 um, uh, teenagers. 
And something interesting that I looked up or was finding out recently, the um, counties in New Mexico that have the highest rate are like 84 um, per 100,000. Wow. That's the, the, the birth rate, not the pregnancy rate. Um, and all of the counties, the three high counties with the highest teen birth rate um, are all in kind of southwestern New Mexico and they all border Texas. So they all have that in common. And they're, and they're a little bit more rural. Um, so the good news is that it's getting better. Um, in 2011, we had the lowest teen birth rate in recorded history, so that's fantastic. Um, and I just liked this because it doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> right, <laughs> teen pregnancy drops yeah. <laughs> after age 25. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I could believe that one. Yeah. <laughs> so um, this just shows you a graph of teen, again, teen birth, birth rates. Um, in all races and what is particularly pertinent to us is if you look at that top line that has come down the most dramatically that's in hispanic females so that's really really good news that's fantastic that means that you guys are definitely doing something right okay so contraception why is it so challenging the most common type of contraception used by adolescents is the least effective so pills condoms and the withdrawal method and okay, so my uh, good friend, she does family planning in Atlanta, and she was driving behind a car, and this was their license plate. <laughs> this is like a real person's license plate. God. And um, so, in the bulletin and uh, to or sorry, committee opinion in 2012, ACOG announced that long acting, acting reversible contraception should be used as the first line method of contraception in, in adolescents. And that's pretty remarkable because previously there was no first line of contraception. There, was, there were things that you had contraindications to, but there was no true first line. <coughs> so um, LARC, or long-acting reversible contraception, includes the implanon, uh, or now the next phenom, which is an implantable method, the levonorgestrel IUD that you guys know as Mirena, or the copper IUD. And the reason that it is considered um, first line is fairly obvious. So continuation rates of LARC, this is overall not just in adolescents, is 86%, whereas the continuation rate on the other methods combined is 55%. So they're more likely to just quit it and not switch to something else and never go to their doctor or to their nurse to get something new. And then the failure rate additionally is um, far lower in the long-acting reversible methods than it is in the other methods. And the one to nine percent, adolescents are gonna be the, on the nine percent or higher because they're gonna be less likely to remember their pills and, or change their patch, et cetera. So we'll start with the implanon. So implanon or nexplanon, um, as you guys know, probably is effective for three years. Um, it contains 68 milligrams of etnogestrol, which is just a progesterone-only me method. Um, the way that it is, um, oops, did I do, no. Um, it works by inhibiting ovulation, it also suppresses the endometrium, and it um, thickens the mucus. So these are the three methods that it um, prevents pregnancy through. Um, it does require a specific training, so right now um, I've contacted the Merck representative and I'm trying to get trained to be a trainer, so it may be possible for me to train you guys. Otherwise there are um, multiple different trainers, um, and I think Dr. McGrath like, gave you the, the name of the one that they use at UNM. And I think a number of the the clinicians around the table have been trained. Can we just see how many oh, of you yeah. received training? So it really is more a question of getting a little practice. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, it has been shown that overall the next planon will decrease blood loss with menstruation. It can decrease pain. Um, it does not change bone mineral density, so it is progesterone only, but unlike depo Provera, you don't have to counsel about um, the decrease in bone mineral density. Um, I think the most important thing when we're counseling patients, especially high schoolers, about this is that it is fantastic. You don't have to remember to take it. It's very, very effective. It can make your period lighter or less painful. 
Um, but the bleeding that you do have will be less predictable. So you could have a little bit of bleeding at the beginning of the month and then maybe some spotting in the middle of the month and then maybe one day at the end. So if they're expecting it, I think they respond much better to it. One study did find that up to 23% of users discontinued it for that reason, for the irregular bleeding. So they just have to be counseled very carefully. And um, there, I'm not going to lie, it's not fun to take out. Have you guys taken out many? I know Monica has. Nor plants. Nor plants. Okay, well, this is <coughs> like a dream. <laughs> for sure. Um, Unless it's that one rod that's tricky to get out. Yeah, yeah, why, why is it so hard to get out? Why is it so hard to get out? Yeah, that's just true. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think it's because the way that you're getting it out, you're putting pressure at the tip of it, but that's what you want to come to the surface, mm -hmm. you know? So one, so I've learned a couple of tricks. So one thing is, is that, you know, the rod itself. So if you put, oh, do I have a pointer? So usually you'll make an incision right here to take it out. So if you kind of put pressure back here to raise this, and then this is what it took me a long time to learn, but it's very helpful. And you guys might already know this, but if you inject the local under it, instead of above it, then you'll know where to make your mark. Cause what will happen is you'll see it perfectly. Then you inject the local and you have no idea where it went. And then the other reason it can be a little bit tricky is because it often have, has a little capsule around it. So you can see it and you can grab it, but you can't pull it out. And so you just have tissue. to take your, yeah, you just have to take your knife and just very gingerly go over. If you do it too hard, then you'll just cut off the tip of the implant. And, and that's not a good thing either. No. <laughs> um, and many methods have been studied on how to control the bleeding. Um, so you can do, of course, combine oral contraceptives. This is not going to work very well in patients that are on it because they had a contraindication to estrogen. So um, you could do like a, a low dose pill or a regular pill for like one to three months. Um, you could do a high dose cyclic uh, progesterone for up to three months as well. Or I think it's easier to just do a progesterone only pill. Um, NSAIDs and COX-2 inhibitors actually in most studies have not panned out to work very well. And then they've done pilot studies on both tranexamic acid and doxycycline. Um, and they're, they're both very promising. Have you guys, are you familiar with tranexamic acid or do you guys use that for anything? Mm -hmm. It's called Lysteta. It's using, it's you, I use it a lot because I see girls that have bleeding disorders. And so their periods are, you know, they like exsanguinate once a month. So it's really good for, you don't have to have a bleeding disorder to use it. It's good for any girl or woman that has a really heavy period that goes on for a long time and if they don't want to be on birth control then this is a good option and what can you spell it tranexamic acid mm -hmm. oh but the other name oh lysteda is l-y-s-t-e-d-a it's an anti-fibrinolytic and there's actually the generic form is called amicar or a-m-i-c-a-r um, and so if this isn't covered by insurance and it's not worth it it's too expensive just do the amicar the problem is that Amacar, you have to take like four horse pills, like four times a day, and there's more GI upset. And like say, it's just, it's a little bit better tolerated. So you use it for Von Willebrands and... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Does it work for <coughs> endometriosis patients or would you use OCPs for that? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so then the IUDs. Um, and I know at least... Right now, we're not going to be doing IUDs in the school-based health system, but I'm hopeful that at some point, maybe this is something that we would be able to do. Um, the levonorgestrel IUD lasts for five years. It's, again, progesterone only, but it uses levonorgestrel. Um, it thins the endometrial lining and thickens the mucus. Um, some women don't ovulate, but about 60% of them still will. So that's not the, the method with which it's most effective. But it is kind of a dream medication or insertion because it's really, really effective in treating heavy periods, painful periods, um, endometriosis, endometrial hyper hypertrophy in the adult population. Um, so you also have to counsel um, patients with this. I always tell them that you're going to have cramping and you're going to have bleeding and that could, the cramping will usually go away, away within a couple of weeks. The abnormal bleeding can unfortunately go on for months. But if you stick with it for six months, most women love their IUD. Most people, and there's probably women in this room that have an IUD. And the greatest part is my old nurse had an IUD, and so she would tell 
my patients, like, I have an IUD and I love it. I mean, people just will, like, proselytize over their IUD. <laughs> so it's really great. Usually most people end up having a regular, very, very light period. Um, less than half of women will be amenorrheic, so I don't guarantee that they won't have a period, but it'll be much lighter and much more manageable. Um, so then the copper IUD, um, that lasts for 10 years. It's hormone-free. Um, it works by causing some local inflammation, inhibiting sperm and ovum mobility. Um, it can decrease, oh, sorry. If a patient already has a painful period or a heavy period, this can make it a little bit worse. So this is really good for people that either have completely normal periods and really want the 10 years, or in the population that says, you know, I really, really don't want hormones. And then they're willing to deal with maybe a little bit of a heavy period, heavier period, because it's a very good form of birth control and they're avoiding the, the hormones. Um, and at what time are we here until? So I have a... 4.30. 4.30. 4.30. Okay, yeah. So we'll go through the other ones. I think we have time. So the... Um, IUD, um, it's, th these are other things that have changed, not um, in the really near past, or not in the recent past, recent past thinking, <laughs> not in the recent past, but um, I think the way that practitioners are approaching it has changed in the recent past. So we know that it's absolutely safe to insert an annulip. So a patient doesn't have to have ever been pregnant or have kids to have an IUD. Um, it does not increase the risk of infertility, and as far as the risk of um, PID that's been associated with it, with the two IUDs that are on the market, that risk is only present for the first 21 days. So women that have an IUD put in, if they're complaining of abnormal discharge and their, patient, their partner was recently treated for chlamydia, then I would either, well in that case you could just treat them. Um, and then have them come back in three to four weeks. And once you have a negative test, you can put it in. Or if you have a negative test three months later, you can put it in. I tend not to wait three months, especially in our patient population, because they could very easily get pregnant in that time. But one thing that we will do, we've done actually with one of Monica's patients is um, we'll do, oh no, we offered it to her, but she wouldn't take it. So we'll do a bridge with something else. So if they're really, really nervous about it and you want to do a test or you're just going to treat them and they have a positive test, just, you can just give them a depot and then they're covered for three months. And sometime in that three months, they can come back, have a negative test and have the IUD put in. The risk of PID is only in that first 21 days. So after that, it no longer, even if you contract gonorrhea or chlamydia while you have the IUD in, it is not going to increase your risk of PID. It's only that first 21 days. Mm -hmm. So if a girl comes to you for a routine exam and she would like an IUD, you can put in an IUD, collect gonorrhea and chlamydia. If it comes back positive, you don't have to take it out. You just treat. If she comes back in and she's not feeling any better and it appears that she has PID, then you can take it out. But initially, you can just treat through it. It doesn't have to be taken out. And then coming soon um, is uh, something called Skyla. It's another progesterone-only IUD, but it lasts for three years instead of five years. Um, the failure rate is about the same as the other forms of IUD. The discontinuation rate seems a little bit higher, but in this particular study, when it was compared against the other IUDs, the discontinuation rate was about around 21%. In the previous um, study that I showed you guys, it was more like 15 to 16%. Um, so I'm not a huge fan of this for our patient population because I feel like once we get it in, we should get like the maximum contraceptive benefit out of it. But it is supposed to be a little bit smaller diameter, so it's possible that it'll be easier to put in. And maybe some practitioners will be more comfortable with this, um, especially in patients that haven't been pregnant or haven't had a child. Um, so then I was just going to go for, through some other forms of contraception. Um, and you guys are using pills and you have depot available i'm guessing you don't have the patch is that correct we can prescribe it okay i don't okay if anybody else does it's usually pretty expensive so i don't think most like community-based health programs have it but and then what about the vaginal ring you can prescribe it do you guys we can it? prescribe it okay. we don't have it okay um so we'll just go through this and you guys can kind of let me know what's more and less useful to you in terms of the the nitty-gritty of each type of birth control um, so medroxyprogesterone acetate is a depot. It's a progesterone only. Um, 
It can be used more frequently than every three months. So if you have a patient that's really bothered by their period, it's really, really heavy, or they're getting it like twice a month, for the first like three months, you could give it every month or two just to kind of shut down the system and then space it out to every three months and they're more likely to be amenorrheic or have a light period. You never want to give this to somebody to regulate their period because it doesn't. It results in kind of abnormal bleeding. Some women will continue to have a perfectly normal light period on it, but a lot of them will have irregular bleeding. Again, it shouldn't be heavier bleeding or more days of bleeding, um, but maybe a little bit more irregular. irregular. And then something that's been coming through the pipelines for a while, and I'm actually surprised that it's not out yet, but maybe soon, is they've been looking at a subcutaneous um, injection for Depo-Provera, just basically for ease of administration so that you, the patient could do it at home. They don't have to go into a clinic or... Um, oh, Yeah, right. yeah, to have it placed. And it basically has shown that it's just as effective. There is the same decrease in bone mineral density with doing it subcutaneously versus doing it IM. And... Um, there is no difference in the, the weight gain, which we will talk about that, and no difference in the, in the amenorrhea. This particular study found 71% versus 80% having amenorrhea, but the patients were on it for um, three years, and I'll show you a slide of that. So the weight gain. Everybody is concerned about this, especially teenagers. So one thing I want to point out is that this is the only form of contraception that has been proven to be associated with weight gain. So when they stress out about being on a pill or a patch or an IUD, those are absolutely not associated with weight gain. The average weight gain is um, 5.1 kilograms over three years. Um, and That's a lot. Well, so it's about 10 pounds, but if you think about it, you're, that's also looking at like a 13 year old to it's a, it's a <coughs> right exactly exactly um, the bone mineral density decreases most significantly in the first two to three years and it's funny because most of the things that that were originally talking about bone mineral density and depo were saying kind of reevaluate after three years see if they want to continue taking it um, and then there's all this hoopla about DEXA scans and what we should do. Right now, I don't think that there's a reason to do a DEXA scan, but I do tell all my patients to take calcium and vitamin T D um, that are using DEPO. The thing is, after two to three years, the bone mineral density, the rate at which it decreases, kind of plateaus. So the first two to three years are kind of the worst years. And if they want to be on it longer than that, it's actually not going to make that big of a difference. And then it reverses after the medication is discontinued. And this is even more true in adolescents than it is in the adult population. So most studies will say around 24 months will go back to their mean bone mineral density, depending on how long they were on it. Um, but for adolescents, that's probably even less. It's probably even less than 24 months. Um, and then it's really good for certain patient populations. So it increases seizure threshold. And when you say increase seizure threshold, that actually means a decrease in seizures just kind of confusing but and then um, we don't see this as much here but in sickle cell patients it decreases sickling so it can decrease sickle crises mm -hmm. um, and then this is the graph that I was just kind of telling you guys about so this is comparing the sub Q versus the IM depo and the decrease in bone mineral density and what you can see is that the fall is pretty dramatic over the first three two or three years but from here on it just kind of plateaus and um, this, this study was just demonstrating that the difference between sub-Q and IM was not different. Okay, so the contraceptive ring, um, the ring contains both um, progesterone and estrogen. Um, it's as, if not more, effective than any OCP. So anytime you are taking something less than once a day, the level of efficacy is going to increase, especially in this patient population. Um, I think a good, excuse me, a good... Um, indicator of patients or adolescents that will tolerate this or teenagers that will tolerate this is if they use a tampon. If they're not comfortable using a tampon, they're not going to be comfortable putting this in. Um, and then the other thing that um, we're actually doing a study in, in my fellowship is how to um, increase the continuation rate of this. And what we're finding is even if you prescribe it, even if you don't have it in your school-based health clinic, um, or your whatever clinic, if you prescribe it to them and then have them bring it in and you place it for them the first time so you can show them how it's supposed to sit and they can see if it's uncomfortable, they can see if they need to adjust it, or you can just reassure them that like, yeah, maybe you can feel it, but that's actually perfectly normal. It's not in a bad place. Um, 
and it can be associated with vaginal irritation expulsion or discomfort during sex but most patients that use this don't complain of the the um, discomfort during sex at all and then just for completeness sake i included this progerine this is not i don't i don't know anything about this this is not fda um, approved or available in the us um ortho ever is the patch um, again, because it's not daily, it's going to be um, as, if not more, effective than any kind of um, birth control pill. There is a slight increased risk of thromboembolism compared to combined oral contraceptives, but the, um, the data has been very contradictory on that. Um, so out of all the studies that were pooled by this particular meta-analysis, one-fourth of them found that there was an increased risk of clot, and the rest of, rest of them felt like it was the same as with a combined OC, uh, combined oral contraceptive. So I stopped prescribing the patch because, because of those that. studies. Do you still prescribe Oh, yeah. Oh. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. The other, the patient population that I really like to use this in, I have a lot of patients in common with GI for like a chronic abdominal pain or chronic pelvic pain, um, which I don't like to advertise because it's not my favorite thing to do. But... Um, they, I will often give them a trial for this because then we're bypassing the GI system. So the oh, estrogen yeah. isn't making them nauseous, you know, they'll, uh, those patients may tend to have problems anyways with anything I prescribe, but if not the placebo, not placebo, I guess, just the peace of mind that, you know, we're not going through your GI, we're not going through their gut, we're not using any of that or your stomach. It um, sometimes will make them feel better and they'll tolerate it a little bit better. Um, and I don't have, yeah, I don't have um, a graph for this one. I do for Yasmin because of all the stuff that's been out lately about Yasmin. Um, but yeah, only a quarter of the studies actually show that it was a, a increased risk. And the other thing is, whenever you're, um, you're uh, counseling these women, I have a graph actually that demonstrates this later. So we'll, we'll come back to it. Um, and then... Um, oral contraceptives are basically the progesterone only pill. So this um, is used, <laughs> it shouldn't be used ever at all. Um, <laughs> no, there, there are perfectly um, good reasons to use it if women have a contra uh, contraindication to estrogen and they don't like any of the other progesterone only methods. Um, I will use this often in patients that are um, severely developmentally delayed so it's very difficult for their parents when they have a period every month and somebody else is in charge of giving them their medication. They're taking medications every day anyway, so I know they're not going to miss it. Um, but as a form of contraception, it's not that good. And it's actually not recommended um, to use in adolescence because of the efficacy. And if they forget a day, it's a much bigger deal than just forgetting a day of the pill. And then um, combined, this was just kind of, we had talked about in our clinic, clinic which is... Um, primarily pediatricians and pediatric nurse practitioners, because they just wanted to know like what, there's a billion pills. So which one do you use? What are the risks and benefits of each of them? And there's, there's not a lot of magic behind it. There's a few key elements. One of them is to just have a good cheap pill kind of in, um, you know, in your back pocket that you can use. So that for me is Labor, it's $9 at Walmart. And then we'll talk about the Drospirinone containing um, or sorry, I said Labora, Sprintec or Labora. Sprintec is the one that's nine dollars out. Yeah, Sprintec. I was going to say yeah, that's nine bucks. Yeah. yeah. Um, Drosperinone containing, which is like the Yasmin Yazocella, and then low dose, just to know that it's an option. Can I have? Yeah. Before you go to the next slide, the progesterone only. Is that um, a good choice for women who have? borderline hypertension or sure absolutely so. i mean it's you're talking about adult women or mm -hmm. teenagers. so yeah i mean i it's still not as effective as doing right. uh, uh iud or implanon even in the adult population but yeah that's what okay. a lot of them will often be on um so the progesterone only pill nor qd camille heather Aaron, any female name I found it. Uh, <laughs> um, and this works by thickening cervical mucus and thinning out the endometrial lining. The failure rate is nine nine percent plus. So on, I don't know if you remember the spectrum of failure of um, oral contraceptives was like one to nine percent, and so progesterone is on the. the and line. does it also go up with increasing weight? I don't know. It's like 187 pounds. It must be a kilo measurement, 90 kilos or something. So the. That is really specific for um, for the implant. Oh, I'm so sorry, and I didn't even mention it. So um, 
if you're greater than a hundred and ninety-five, what is it? One ninety-five. I, I thought it was one eighty-seven. No, for it, it's actually <laughs> it's ideal body weight. So it's I think it's a hundred and thirty-five times normal body weight. They didn't actually okay. look at a weight, and it's not. You can still use it. You just counsel the patient that we don't know that it's less effective. It just wasn't included in the study. Okay. Yeah. Does that but there's sense? yeah, and that's for implanon. That's for implanon. Because there's a decreased efficacy of OCPs over 85 over, kilos or whatever yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, but that's our patient population right. now. I and I also think that the data to that is kind of conflicting as okay. well. I don't think we have hardcore evidence saying okay. other than, you know, if, yeah, if you test their, like, circulating levels, it's going to be lower just because their volume of distribution is greater. Okay. Um, and it's still effective. But it's still like yes. yes. That's the bottom line. Yeah. Okay. It goes from like 1% to 2%. Right. Um, so the combined oral contraception, like I said, Sprintec or Orthocycline, that's $9 at Walmart. Um, it's monophasic. Um, I typically don't use triphasic. There's been several studies that have shown that they don't really benefit anything for efficacy, dysmenorrhea, menorrhagia, any of those things. There's no difference between using triphasic versus monophasic. Every once in a while, there will be a patient that is on a triphasic pill and she'll swear by it and say that she goes crazy on a monophasic, which is fine and I'll continue it, but otherwise there's not really a reason for it. So pills work by suppressing ovulation and thinning the endometrial lining. Again, the, um, the failure rate ranges from one to 9% for adolescents. It's more on the 9% or higher. Um, and then the low dose pill um, is good for patients that have a lot of side effects on a, on a regular pill. Um, that's almost the only reason that I ever use it is if a patient is complaining of stuff on a regular pill, then we'll try a low dose pill. Um, sometimes the side effects that they're complaining about will be just effectively treated if you just change to a different 30 or 35 microgram pill. Um, and then now there is um, low, low estrin. So low, low estrin has 24 days of um, 20 of estrogen plus progesterone and then two days of estrogen alone and then two days of iron. Um, and it has been shown to be just as effective as, mm -hmm. as the normal pill. But um, unless you guys have like a pharmaceutical representative going to you guys, this is still not kind of on the generic side. So it's probably not the ideal. Um, it may or may not have increased breakthrough bleeding because the level is so low. Um, but what they've tried to do is extend your hormone, or sorry, minimize your hormone-free um, phase of the cycle. So it's only really two days. And they're doing that in an effort to decrease the, the breakthrough bleeding. Okay, so the drosperinone-containing birth control pills. So these have been um, just assaulted by... Uh, lawyers lately on television for whatever reason. Um, so this one, I've noticed this is like, um, if you have like a Middle Eastern or Mediterranean <laughs> name of a pill, then it's usually drosperinone. It's usually like a generic equivalent to Yasmin. So like Zara, Gianvi. Um, I actually really like this pill. It's good for polycystic ovarian syndrome because of its anti-androgenic effects. So to be completely honest, actually, when they looked at comparative studies, relatively few of them have shown that this is better than any other pill. But you also have a little bit of the spironolactone. So in the patients that are PCOS that tend to be a little bit more overweight, they also benefit from this like little um, decrease in weight in the very beginning for like the first month or two. And that can often, you know, kickstart something else. Um, it's also um, been used in studies and been more effective to some other um, um, types of combined oral contraceptives for PMS and uh, PMDD. Um, the ones that were specifically more effective were actually a 24-4 cycle instead of the, the um, traditional Yasmin, which is a 21-7 like we're used to. And I believe that one is the Gianvi. Um, so um, there may be an association with risk of thromboembolism, but the data is not strong enough to conclude causality. So this is what I like to go over with patients, kind of regardless of what they, oh no, how sad. This guy belongs, oopsie. <laughs> this guy belongs down here in the, 
and the per U per US FDA study users of drosperinone containing <laughs> oral contraceptives. Um, and so in a non-pregnant non-user of OCPs, their risk of having a blood clot is uh, one to five per 10,000 women years. And then on a normal pill, it's three to nine. On Yasmin, it may be as high as 10.2, but we're going from like nine to 10.2. So even if it is, even if the studies that show that it's statistically significant, in my opinion, it's not clinically significant. Um, pregnant women is any their risk of a thromboembolism anywhere from five to 20. And this is my favorite, favorite. So in the postpartum period, your risk of having a blood clot is literally six times of that, even on the worst pill possible. So I always tell my patients, you know people that get pregnant all the time. And unfortunately, in high school in Albuquerque, you really do know people that get pregnant all the time. And um, they're, uh, they don't have blood clots. And so this, while there is a risk of this and you're going to hear about it on TV, et cetera, the actual chance of it affecting you is slim to none. Now, of course, there are exceptions to the rule, like patients that have um, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, of course, they would have a contraindication to estrogen if they've had a history of blood clot on a birth control pill. So there are, of course, patients that have very serious side effects, and I don't want to minimize anything that they go through, but for our average teenager, any type of birth control that we give them. I use 50 microgram pills, which is like unheard of now, but it works better in patients that have bleeding disorders. And I, I'm yet to see a blood clot. So these are all 35 microgram pills. Um, so then continuous. It can be done with any pill, so you don't need to do season eek or season L. Um, you can just prescribe them number 84 instead of number 28 so that when they, they go to the pharmacy, they'll pick up three packs instead of just one. And then you just have to give them instructions, and I usually just draw out for them either a circle or four lines, and I tell them when you get to the last pill on the third line, you just start a new pill pack and you throw out the, the bottom pills. Um, and it can be used very effectively for menorrhagia, dysmenorrhea, PMS, um, menstrual migraines. So um, at 13 months, 50% um, of women in a continuous group were amenorrheic versus 2.2 .2 in the cyclic group. And this isn't rocket science. The people in the cyclic group were taking the placebo pill, so we would expect them to have a period. Some of them, um, their endometrial lining will thin out so much that they'll either have a very light period or they won't have a period at all. Um, and then the women in the 13 month group. So what that means is they didn't have a placebo week for 13 months. Mm -hmm. And so don't be afraid if they wanna go longer than three pill packs, that's totally fine. I just do it like that for ease of administration. And it's actually kind of stupid that I do do it like that and I'll show you why in a second. Um, but historically that's what we've been doing is about like every three months they'll have a, they'll have a period. So I have this image that when I've done that, I've had people do three months and then maybe four or five or six and, and kind of build up to it. So at least you shed off their endometrium on the way to suppression. Is that, I mean, I think that, that the, no, I mean, theoretically it does work really well. And what this, this study was looking at specifically was seeing how long we can go. Cause we don't really know how long is it safe to go without a period. But the fact of the matter is if you're keeping the endometrial lining really thin, you don't have to have one ever. And we know that because people with IUDs may not have a period for four years and they're fine. They're perfectly healthy. Same with depo. Um, so it clinically makes sense, but I'll show you a chart in a second that, um, that three month, that first three month gap, might be kind of the worst way to do it. Okay. And I'll show you, I'll show you why. Uh, I still do it, I'm thinking about changing it, but I'll, I still do it. Um, so of course, breakthrough bleeding or bleeding kind of in between periods that was irregular was more common in the study group. So any bleeding that they had at all is gonna be irregular breakthrough bleeding, right? Because they're not supposed to bleed at all. Versus the patients that were taking it um, cyclically, 11% of them had bleeding in between periods when they weren't supposed to. Um, the study group did have a higher discontinuation rate because they were complaining of side effects. So I am yet to go to a year with someone, but if the patient really wanted to, I would be fine. Okay, so this is why I think that I should change what I'm doing. And Because traditionally, we do think of it as a continuous cycle as being every three months. But if you look here, the incidence of breakthrough bleeding is actually the highest at three months when you're continuous for three months. So it's like doing anything else is smarter than that. Interesting. Yeah. 
And then, again, this is just one study, but... Um, and then Season 8 specifically has 84 days of a combined pill and then 7 days of just um, estrogen. So that's why this is actually really, really good for people that have withdrawal symptoms. So very severe PMS or menstrual migraines, this can work very well for them. And there are none like that with more of a third generation. Right, exactly. Yeah. Which is why I, I do it the other way. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so emergency <laughs> contraception. Um, you got, I think when I talk to you guys, you guys do have this available, yes. correct? So yes. can, okay, which is fantastic. Um, if patients are uncom uncomfortable taking it, you can always tell them that it's available over the counter um, to women uh, over 17 in New Mexico. 17 and over. Yeah. 17, so, um, you're totally right. 17 and over, you're absolutely correct. Um, so, um, I call, well, we'll go through each of them individually. So um, this is the plan B, which is um, either one tab and you would repeat that 12 and 12, uh, tab in 12 hours, or you would take um, double the dose at one time. Um, it's um, effective up to 72 hours post intercourse, and people will use it longer than that. We'll use it up to five days post intercourse, but the efficacy decreases. So the efficacy you can no longer say is two to 3%. Um, so I talked to uh, Walgreens on uh, Central and Gerard, and they had um, they had the this one, the um, Plan B and the Ella, which I'll talk about in a second. They had that in stock and available. It was forty eight dollars. The Walmart right across the street from Highland. Who's from Highland? Highland. Okay. The Walmart right across the street from Highland had them both for less expensive, but they were not in stock and they, they were on back order, but which doesn't make any sense because there's no other place. There's not, I shouldn't say there's no other place, but other places have it in stock. That actually makes a lot of sense. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it's a, that. it's a religious thing. Yeah. They do there are so places they that to, yeah, will. No. Well, right, right. Which is why I call them. There was actually um, a big study that Eve Espy and Tony Ogburn um, did, it, it was like nine years ago now, to look at the places that right. had it available. Um, and so, but I thought there was something specific to that Walmart. No. So yeah, it's kind of it's, up to the pharmacist's dis it's discretion. It's a very um, conservative pharmacist, pharmacist there. <laughs> is that right? Do, do they, does anybody know, do they have a conservative pharmacist at that I Walmart? I don't know, but I've talked to Walgreens and sometimes you have to call ahead to make sure there's a pharmacist there who will dispense yeah. it. Even so if they have it in stock. They're supposed so to refer you to another Walgreens where there is one who will dispense it, but sometimes mm -hmm. they don't do that. Yeah. Right. And so the one, um, I've called like a couple of different times for a couple of different reasons and I've mainly focused around that central area and then I called mm -hmm. the Highland Walmart just because I knew some of you guys were going to be at Highland. And then I'm sorry, I just didn't know what was cl really close to Albuquerque High, so I didn't call any of those places. But um, the one on Walmart, or the one on Central, the Walgreens on Central in Richmond, every time I've called there, they've had it available for distribution. And their, um, their reaction to it is like, this is a perfectly normal prescription that we should stock like every other prescription. So if you need to tell your patients to go somewhere, I would start with that. Walgreens. Would that be Central and Gerard? I'm sorry, I said Central and Richmond. Yeah, okay. Central and Gerard. It's actually between Central and Gerard and Central and Richmond. But yes, Central and Gerard. I've had really good luck with the Smiths on Carlisle as well. Oh, that's good mm. to know. Yes. Okay, yes. I didn't even think of that. Every that's a time great one. I've tried that one, the guy's been, oh, absolutely, no problem. You know, okay, good. Like, this is something that should be available for people. Oh, good. So that's unless he great. left in the last couple of years. <laughs> um... And then um, through with school-based health, this is provided through Title X, is that correct? Mm -hmm. So that's great. So Ella is um, one tab, and this was basically constructed <coughs> as a plan B, for, but for greater, uh, greater amount of time. So it's 120 hours, which is five days, um, with a failure rate that's less than that of plan B. So um, this is a little bit more expensive, and I think that we're less likely to just have it available in the school-based health system. So if you want to use Plan B for five days, I think that's fine. But if you can use this, then it's great. Um, so at the um, same Walgreens on Central and Girard, it was $51 for Dallas. So it's a little bit more expensive. And they oh, had it. They had it. They absolutely had it. Yeah, he said that he thinks he only had one, but they had it. Um, 
And he did have to look for it because he said, with the plan B, he was like, yeah, I know we have it. I know it's here. And then the Ella, he's like, I know that we have had it in the past. Let me see if we have one here now. And they did. Because I had a four-dayer today, and about three weeks ago, I had a five-dayer. Okay. Yeah. So if they can get Ella, that's great. But like I said, if not, do, um, do a plan B. Okay. Just do it. And just counsel them, you know, that there might be a higher risk of failure. Yeah. Yeah, Medicaid is the Plan B? Yeah. Plan Ella. Medicaid is. Oh, Ella, I don't know. I've never prescribed it. Prescription and you can get it. Okay. No, I gave her Plan B one step. So the yeah. other the other thing is is um we went through the several patients to try to give the different price ranges and who it would be um covered by. So the prices that I gave you guys were for patients that were paying just out of pocket. So mm -hmm. had no insurance nothing. Um so this is kind of the most expensive it can be. And then the, the greatest one is the copper IUD. Um, and you know, all um, if you guys are in a situation um, like this, you can always call and you're in like the three to four day period. You can always call either me or Center for Reproductive Health. Um, if I only have clinic on Mondays and um, Thursdays, um, CRH is open every day, but I'll be willing to just overbook them in and put in a copper IUD for um, for plan B. And the reason that it's fantastic is that it works really great. The failure rate is less than 1% and it lasts for five days and then they have a form of contraception. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, um, I worked at a like community based health, um, program and, um, fellowship. And I just wanted you guys to, to see this. This is from up to date. If you're ever in a situation where you're not getting plan yeah. B, multiple different combinations of birth control pills that are over the counter can be used as plan B. Um, the efficacy is not as well studied and sometimes it'll make patients a little bit nauseous. So I'll give them like four milligrams of Zofran, which is usually less expensive than the um, eight milligram, or you can give them like a thinner again. <clears throat> okay, so, um, this was from that time magazine that was the cover oh. from december of 1985 and then this is 1985. yeah can you guys believe that 1985 um and then this was a teen march in um san francisco about um, awareness of teen pregnancy and contraception and their shirts just to say don't be a statistic Do you guys have any questions? I have a question. Sure. This is this is Julie down in Lordsburg. Um, I recently attended the Contraceptive Technology Conference in San Francisco and uh, went through the training to place the Nexplanon. However, uh -huh. um, I have trouble getting the funding for it because the the organization that I work for won't pay for it. Um, so we end up sending girls to the public health department. Do you know of any funding for uh, doing the um, confidential visits and people who don't have private insurance? Um, so as, as long as you're not doing abortion, um, Title, 10 fa Title 10 funds would be available. Um, I personally have not filled out that application, but I hear it is very rigorous and long and involved. Um, and that's that's the only thing that I know of offhand. Um, Center for Reproductive Health is a great place to send patients because they have a sliding scale. So they can do an IUD or an implanon for everything for like, I think it's $125. So it's still, it's not inexpensive, but it's less than it would be a lot of other places. What about Medicaid? I mean, can you write a prescription for Medicaid and have them go to the pharmacy and get it? Hmm. Um, it, it, I, for the implant on? Yeah. I mean, that's what we do at Depo. They go and they pick up the vial and then come to clinic and we administer. Yeah, I don't think that they... I haven't actually called any pharmacies to check, but I don't think that they would carry. But it could be a pharmacy... Well... Like a pharmacy within a hospital may carry it, but I think they're, it would be their inpatient pharmacy and you can't pick up a prescription from the inpatient pharmacy if you're an outpatient. 
Oh. Mm -hmm. We are very rural down here. We don't have a pharmacy in our town. We have a pharmacy about an hour away, and they do deliver prescriptions, but usually the kids don't have money to go pay for their own prescriptions. So um, unless Medicaid covers it completely, I, which I don't know if they do or not, um, but they, if they're trying to do it without their parents knowing about it, it can be a barrier. Yeah. As far as I know, Medicaid should cover it. Um, I'm trying to think at CRH, we're more kind of intimately involved with the billing there. And I think the the Medicaid patients, it's covered for them. And I, there are multiple, yeah. the problem is that there's multiple different types of Medicaid too. So I can't guarantee yeah. that what every patient has is going to have it. Well, mm -hmm. for, for teenage, teenage population on Medicaid, it would be covered and there would be no EOB that would be sent out so it would remain confidential. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, so the issue though is um, to, ha to get it stocked. I mean, that's the issue. Um, yeah. You'd have to go, if, I could check on, this is Paula, I could check on how you could order that for Medicaid patients and then get reimbursed when you submit the claim. I think that's that would how be you nice. to do it. But I'll, I'll check on that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Are you, are you the one from Portales? Lordsburg. Lordsburg, oh, okay. Okay. Hidalgo Medical Services. Oh, okay. And I'm at the school-based clinic. Right. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions? I put the information up here. I have cards for people that are in the room, but it occurred to me that, um, you know, there's people that aren't in the room. So <laughs> this is the number to my clinic, and if you have a, a patient that you would like to have um, like an IUD or a Nexplanon, or if they're a little bit more complicated, they have like medical, um, uh, previous medical history that's complicated, you can always refer to myself or um, Center for Reproductive Health, and that's run by um, Eve Espy. So any? you're out of YCHC? Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay, yeah. interesting. Any uh, news on the male contraceptives? Oh. <laughs> I, um, that is a, a fantastic question that I don't have and not even a clue okay. about. Like, I don't even hear about. <coughs> well, I, who, who was it that went to the conference in San Francisco? Did they bring it up? Uh, yeah, it was briefly discussed, but there wasn't really much um, in the works. <laughs> the last I had heard, there was a pill that was going to work, but... Well, I recently read about something they're using in India. They've been using it for 25 years. Um, they make a small incision in the scrotum. They pull the tube out. They inject some, uh, some sort of very cheap something into it. It doesn't block it, but it coats the lining so that as the sperm go through, they're sort of torn apart by the magnetic field or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's supposed to be really like 100% for 10 years and completely reversible. And they've been using it for, I just read about this like oh, a wow. month ago. And why don't any of us know about this? How do they reverse it, I wonder? Well, they just inject something in to dissolve it. It gets dissolved and washed through and then everything goes back to normal. That's wild. Yeah, Wouldn't that be great? That. that would be yeah. great. Wow. Yeah, I can see guys signing up for that in gross. <laughs> yeah. Better than cutting them and burning them. And Ouch. Burning them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's like a little plug. Quick and easy and cheap. And it's not a plug. It coats it the coats inside. It. Because the problem with the plugs is you get the backup. And they get all kinds of oh, that's problems right. with that. But it allows the sperm to go through. But it damages them so they cannot impregnate. Wow. Yes. It confuses them, disorients them. <laughs> they don't know where they're going. Well, if you have a, a reference or anything, we can send it to you. Send it, and we can. Supposedly, it it's being looked at by the FDA, and they're going to start studying it here. That's, that's what I saw. So this is kind of a mundane question, but does insurance pay for calcium and vitamin D? Oh, that's a really good question. So. Um, 
I don't, I don't know the answer. I think that they probably would, but because of our patients, I tell them to go get the chews because then they'll take it. Okay. If they're otherwise healthy, they're not taking medication for any other reason, then they're not going to remember to take a vitamin D and calcium pill every day. So I just tell them there's like chocolate, caramel, there's the fruit flavor, and it's really relatively inexpensive. You can get over a month's worth for like five to thirteen dollars. Okay. Yeah. So. Great. Um, have you used? Um, oh God. It's, I got sent a huge box of it. Um, I get sent a box every year of stuff for um, bacterial vaginosis. It's, oh, um, they're yeah. pills. But, but it's not metronidazole? No, no, it's, it's over the counter. There's an injectable gel and the... I've never heard of it. <laughs> Is it for people that have like... Um, Recurrent BV? Or? Yeah, so the pills are a lactobacillus thing, oh, and supposedly okay. the lactobacillus that they ingest orally has been shown to show up in the vaginal fluids. That's absolutely true. So it depends on how, so it's actually better if it's taken in the form of like a yogurt. The less kind of compressed it is and made in a lab into a pill, the, usually the higher levels are Okay, and then the other thing is an injectable gel. And then they have tampons that are pH adjusted tampons. Oh, and yeah, I mean, big. Really? Wow. I don't know. I went to one of those contraceptive technology things. I get all sorts of interesting stuff. Have you had patients that have used it? Yeah. And how, yes. do, how do they feel about it? I have not dispensed it though. Nope. Never. Oh, I see. But the patients that have used it, what do they say? <laughs> Um, not that they got it from you, but right, wherever they got it from. Right. Um, they liked it. Yeah. They liked it. Yeah. I get very, anytime you're talking about n normalizing the pH, so this is another thing that I tell uh, teenagers and adult women too, we're horrible. The vagina is a self-cleaning device. Yeah. And so, you know, if you want to make sure that you have recurrent yeast and BV and vaginitis, then douche, because that's basically the worst thing that you can do. I get really nervous about things that will balance your pH. Um, supplementing lactobacillus in a healthy diet, I think, is, especially in women that will have recurrences, right. I think is totally reasonable. But um, the, I do a lot of hygiene counseling. So some free dice, free soaps and detergents, white cotton underwear, like if you're wearing lycra or something to work out in, changing right afterwards. This is for younger patients than you guys I think usually see, but if they're in um, like uh, swimming over the summer to change out of their bathing suit right afterwards and not sit around in it. And then just counseling that some amount of discharge is normal. Right. And then you know that there is like for women that have recurrence, you can do the, for yeast, it's um, 150 milligrams of diflucan once every three days and then once a month for six months. And then for BV, it's the um, metro gel for seven to 10 days and then twice a week for six months. Could you say that again? Sure. So for yeast, it's yeah, 150 it milligrams um, every 72 hours, so every three days times three, and then once a month for six months. And the metro gel, and the reason that I think the metro gel is a little bit better studied than uh, metronidazole is just because of the potential liver toxicity and people getting nauseous with it. Mm -hmm. So you would use the original course for like seven to ten days, and then twice a week for um, six months again. They did also look at clindamycin for suppression for recurrent um, BB. So if somebody doesn't like the gel for some reason, you could always try it. That's good stuff. Hmm. Any other questions? I'm really glad that the places, the Hidalgo Medical Center and the woman for Talis tuned in. I think you guys have a very difficult job and deserve a lot of, um, you know, respect. And um, thank you for what you're, for what you're doing. I think it's at times a lot harder than what we do here. Thank you. Thank, thank you, doctor, for presenting. Did, um, did anybody else sign on that hasn't announced their name yet? Yes, this is um, Carrie Hopes in Roswell. I signed on late, sorry. Gotcha, Carrie. And this is Elizabeth Vargas. I'm here still. All right, thank you.
And with that, thank you very much. We'll sign off. So I'll just leave the card here for you guys that has the um, clinic number. And I'm happy to give you, oh, I put it should have been myself. So are they still on? They signed off. Um, I'm, 